Welcome everyone to our uh, webinar called Social Disparities in Kidney Care, hosted by Lifebulb and CVS. Uh, we are really uh, happy to have you here. My name is Karin Heenberger. I'm the CEO and founder of Lifebulb. I'm also a kidney transplant recipient, so I fall within the category of uh, patients who are living with, uh, with kidney disease. Uh, this is an important topic uh, today, and um, uh, it is of uh, importance to society, to patients, to uh, doctors, and to industry. And, and that's uh, uh, why we're so happy to have three incredible individuals here who represent different parts of the so-called industry of, of kidney disease. Um, I want to introduce them all in no particular order of importance, but start here with uh, Dr. Hussein, who is an um, assistant professor of medicine at uh, Columbia University Medical Center and is practicing, is treating patients uh, with kidney disease and also with transplant. Next, we have Richard Knight, who is the president of the American Association of Kidney Patients and also is living with a kidney transplant. And then finally, Dr. Ron Raju, who is um, a former senior vice president and chief community health investment officer at Northwell Health, uh, but also um, was the uh, CEO of other health systems, among others, Cook uh, 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 Health System. So we have here representation from patients, patient advocacy, practicing clinicians, former practicing clinicians, and also sitting on top of administrative positions. So um, this area of social disparities in kidney care is a, is a really important one um, because there really is a big need to, um, uh, for change. As many of you know, kidney disease is quite prevalent. One in seven people in this country are living with kidney disease of some sort. However, less than a million people in this country are living with so-called end-stage renal disease. And end-stage renal disease um, means that you're either on dialysis um, or you have a transplant or you're on the verge of getting one of those two treatments. Dialysis is, of course, a multiple a week uh, process of exchanging your blood and cleaning your blood in a, in a very uh, medical way. And a transplant is replacing um, uh, the function that your original native kidneys had in uh, so many different um, functions for the body with either a um, living donor kidney uh, from someone who has given you one of their two kidneys or a disease donor kidney, which for which there is a very long waiting list. So many people are currently waiting for a kidney. Um, what I think is also really important as we start this discussion is that if you are um, an African-American, you have about three times higher risk of ESRD, the serious form of kidney disease. And if you are Hispanic, it's about 1.3 to 1.5 times higher risk. And this cannot only, this is not, only explained, and we'll talk about this, by some sort of racial disparity, it is often connected to a socioeconomic uh, difference. So with that start and, and uh, with this introduction, I'd love to, to just uh, ask first, Richard, um, you know, what, what uh, have you seen in your uh, experience? Is, is there a change going on or are we, are we still, uh, why are we still in this situation where we have such disparity in the area of kidney disease? Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with my colleagues today on this topic. It's a very important topic. And the, the first thing I wanna say is that I think that we've made tremendous progress, but the reality is, is that we have much further to go. And many of the challenges that we face in the healthcare arena, we tend to look at things in silos. But in my view, we're looking at something that is even much larger than healthcare. When we start dealing with issues of disparities, um, you go anywhere from structural racism to social determinants of health. Um, we need to be in a position of, people talk about equity and other things. And I simply say, 
all patients want to be treated equally and fairly. We have a long way to go for that. Um, we always talk about educating patients, and we do need to do that. We also need to educate many of the healthcare professionals. So I think that, um, for example, early identification of this disease, of this disease is critical. But 32% of the patients crash into dialysis from being undiagnosed. I don't understand that. If you have blood work, you have urine, how we cannot identify this earlier and prevent the progression. And you doctors know that we can prevent this pr progression by as much as five, maybe eight years, if you identify early enough and work with the patient in a collaborative fashion for them to do certain things with respect to diet and all the other things that can be used to slow down the disease. But we're certainly not here to beat up on any one profession because I think that primary care physicians have quite a workload in themselves. But it has to do with the system of reimbursement. How much time can we spend with a patient? It's a very complex issue. But I think that as we have sessions like this, we can talk about this. And we have young, fresh eyes looking at different remedies to solve the issue. And then it's a question of, in my view, what is the most important thing, which is implementation of certain actions. So I'll, I'll give it back to you because I could talk on that topic all day, but I'm certainly interested in, you know, hearing yeah. the insights from my colleagues. Yeah. Well, yeah, go ahead, uh, Dr. Raju. You no, know? I think, I think uh, I, again, I also want to thank you for this opportunity, but just to kind of, uh, you know, build on what Mr. Knight talked about, right? The, the fundamental issues are, you know, why there is an increased evidence, increased incidence is, the lack of access, uh, health literacy, and ignoring the outcomes which are directly related to social determinants. In other words, if you have 100% outcome, only 20% is by this greatest healthcare delivery system we have in the world, which spends like $3 billion a year, right? But 80% is really outside the healthcare. It's like food, you know, uh, transportation, lack of insurance, stress, poverty, homelessness, so many things which are, which are involved in that. And that kind of get into that. And the second part of it is, there is this myth that access of lack of access it is due to lack of insurance. That's not the only reason because as Mr. Knight said, even if these people go to see a doctor, there is an unconscious bias, which is built into the healthcare delivery system, as well as the system of racism, which he alluded to, it actually prevents them from getting the thing, for example, if I'm a homeless person, nobody's going to transplant me because that's that is that's it. Because that uh, I am, I could be the most eligible person, but they're not going to do that because what we call as in a, in a medical vernacular, dependable patient is a dependable. They said that he or she will carry on what need to be done after a transplant. So there is a a big discrepancy in there. But one thing we should not forget is. We in healthcare try to look at every problem purely through the medical eyes, through the disease eyes. There is a bigger issue behind that. Behind the disease, there is a human being. And behind the human being, there is a community and a social network, which he himself cannot do that. But not last, which I'm going to, another myth I'm going to break today is the concept of being heritage. They always say, oh, African-American got a higher hereditary chance of doing that. I don't believe it is genetic, it is epigenetics. Over the decades of 300 years, there is so much of stress that's been built into them. Their genetics have, have predisposed them high blood pressure, not because of the fact they'll come to that, because of what happens in epigenetics, this environment which changes them over a period of time, we kind of change them into that. So if we say, oh, genetically they are predisposed to that, that kind of minimizes the entire role, saying that, okay, this is what it is, a part of it. So we have to be very, very careful because healthcare always trying to find some association. That's what we always do. Oh, this associated with that. Not every association is a straight line. We kind of make up them associations as you go along. So I just want to kind of put this in mind. Do not medicalize every issue. Medical is it's important to look at the disease and treat them, but there is a human being behind that and there is a big community behind that. So just have to make sure. So the last part of it is the healthcare in our country, we are only 
improving the seed. The seed is the patient. That's the seed where we give them everything back to them. But we have nothing to do with the soil in which they grow. So we throw them with the best of medication and throw them into the soil which they, where they live with, work with, uh, you know, deal with. If you throw them into that, then that is not that seed is not going to grow. Then you wonder why the outcomes are so different yeah, as, 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 a, as a health care delivery system. So we have a lot of things to do. So I just don't want to medicalize the whole issue, even though the medicine is very important. I, I, my friend Saeed will probably talk about it. So let me stop here and then probably have- Yeah, no, thank you. Question. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Raju. And I think those are valid points. Uh, I do want to um, ask Dr. Hussain, who sees patients and, and sees patients from various different um, uh, you know, parts of the community. Um, I think the point that you know, I have a seed, but no, no soil, that's, that's a critical one. But you know, as a medical professional, uh, you just don't have that time, um, Dr. Hussein. Or, or, or how do you how do you see when you see a patient? You know, different patients coming from different backgrounds. Uh, do you do you focus on different things to make sure that they um, are adherent, they are educated, they um, um, uh, they follow uh, you know your advice? Yeah, I think that's a good question. But I think kind of. Uh... Uh, you know, that question might be rooted in, in some myths about different, how different populations of people behave differently or might be expected to behave differently. So if I, I can maybe answer that question first by picking backing off something kind of a, a theme that both my esteemed colleagues started on, which is that it's not one issue, right, uh, that causes these disparities. And we can look at evidence of that by the fact that every single stage of this process has a disparity. So um, Black Americans, for example, we want to kind of focus on that group, which has historically very large barriers. Uh, and kind of getting good quality care, but they're kind of have a higher, uh, higher have a higher incidence of kidney failure. But they also are more likely to be diagnosed late. Once they're diagnosed, they're less likely to be uh, kind of get home modalities, which people tend to be happier with for kidney replacement therapy. They're less likely to be related, they're referred to transplant. If they are referred, they're less likely to be cleared for transplant. If they are cleared, they're less likely to get a transplant. If they do get a transplant, they're less likely to get a living donor transplant, which is best. So, if we ask ourselves, okay, maybe things like genetics or or socioeconomic status or any of these things impact uh, kind of are the main drivers of, of impacting these barriers to kind of good outcomes for all groups. I think if you, if you step back and look at it, you have to say, okay, there's gotta be something else because even if you select for the best possible patient among all races, the one of a certain group will still be expected to have worse outcomes. So I think um, when we try to answer that question of how do we approach different patients differently because we might know that they're at a higher risk of having a worse outcome. I think the truth is, rather than thinking about things like adherence or um, access to care, the biggest thing we need to do is identify what barriers are we placing as clinicians in helping that patient achieve their best outcome. And I think a great place to look at this is, a, this is a small example, is if we look at patients who've already been cleared for kidney transplant, have kidney failure. So that means they've gone through all the hoops and hurdles and thought to be a good, reliable candidate and gotten on the list, then African-American patients, regardless of socioeconomic status, are less likely than to get a living donor transplant, which is the best possible treatment than even white patients of the worst socioeconomic status. So you have to ask yourselves, what are we doing? And kind of when we approach these patients in terms of encouraging them, kind of uh, helping them understand how they can reach out to kind of living donors and what unconscious biases are we injecting into our conversations that we need to remove. So rather than focusing on characteristics of the patients, maybe focusing on what we are doing wrong as providers to make sure that we're not perpetuating things you know, subconsciously, like uh, Mr. Knight said, he's not trying to blame anyone. And I think it's important, right? No, no one person is to blame, but probably we're all to blame. And I think that, 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 that understanding that is the first step to overcoming these uh, kind of huge disparities that still exist today that are closing, but are still massive. And, and just to follow up on that, I think that's a really a very insightful and uh, uh, humble. I mean, it's a very, very great point. Do you um, kind of hold yourself responsible to that as you, you see patients and, and think about it, um, you know, on, on, a, on a daily basis or weekly basis? I mean, how, how do you hold yourself responsible to it as a one physician? Yeah, I think the key is understanding that we, we, we are all subject to bias, yeah. um, you know, probably inherently and kind of because of the world that we live in that injects a lot of this bias into the way we think. So I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's just being aware that Okay, what am I doing that might be biased? Why, why do I feel that this person, why do I get, you know, like a, maybe not me, but or anyone, right? Why do I feel like, I just have a feeling this patient might be less adherent. Is that something that's a bias that I carry with me before I came in because of the way 
that I perceive this person to be? Like, what is it about this person or what is it about me that's causing it? And I think you have to be conscious that it's a high likelihood that you might be biased in order to overcome that bias. You know, mm -hmm. I think we all like to believe like, you know, I, I would like to believe myself that I, that I treat everyone equally. But the truth is, unless I've been very conscious about making sure that I treat everyone equally, there's probably a tendency among all of us to treat people of different backgrounds, that are especially people that are different than our own, potentially differently. And kind of that consciousness and kind of active um, a recognition of those problems is the key to overcoming them, I think. Very well said. Uh, I, I, Richard, you're, you're about to say something. Oh, no, I was, going, I was just going to um, agree, you know, with yeah. the point that he's making. And then there's so many factors that are involved, but you know, you can't boil the ocean. We have to start strategically, and I think address many of the areas of concern and, and, you know, the interesting thing is, um, for example, um, if you take someone such as Stock here, Hussein, um, he's practicing taking care of patients. He's not thinking about reimbursement issues at CMS. He's not thinking about the fact that there needs to be some changes in legislation, through legislation that can have an impact on HRSA, which oversees um, UNOS and um, the, the Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients so that we can change the number of kidneys that are rejected because we have certain metrics that we follow. Most people don't understand or see that. So Canada has a 5% discard rate. We might have a 25% discard rate. We have to bring the payers in. We have to learn to think long-term instead of short-term. So there's a number of factors and skill sets that we need to focus on. And quite frankly, most rooms and most meetings I go to, I'm the only African-American there and I'm the only patient there. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one with a background. And you, I know you mentioned me as a patient, but I've also been teaching business courses yeah, yeah. Yeah. for over 30 years. So I look at industry structures. You know, We have two dominant firms in the dialysis arena and their business model doesn't necessarily portend well for patients being transplanted, but they are making change. I think we have to acknowledge that and we have to hold them to that standard. But the point that I'm making is that it is such a large system, I find, that most people don't understand it. Patients, yeah. believe it or not, are the ones that go through the full continuum before dialysis, being on dialysis, trying to get a transplant by being on the waiting list, the issues that deal with getting on the waiting list and not being told you've been taken off for some reason. So there's a lot of issues such as that nature. Then you talk about reimbursement. We talk about innovation, I think, which is critical here, innovation, but can we get paid for the innovation? Private sector capital. So it seems like I'm wandering all over the place, but all of those factors have an impact even on the doctor being able to spend more time with a patient because he's got to have a certain throughput to, you know, meet his metrics mm -hmm. so that he can survive. Those medical loans are not inexpensive. And, you know, that that's part of it too. But 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 I think a forum like this, we have a chance to discuss this in, 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 in a backdrop where we have, I think, um, companies that are coming in making radical change to the industry as an organization we spend time with the healthcare professionals, the nephrologists, um, the, 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 the transplant surgeons. We spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. um, trying to educate legislators because there are those that have a certain agenda that may not be in the best interest of patients. I understand that. Um, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. And I think that as we work together, and look at some of these issues, we can move forward and make some radical change because we do need change for the better. Well, I think I think you raise an important point that you know when when we're trying to make a change in a market or in a community, depending on how we define it, we need representation for all those constituents. We can't just have uh, you know as, as in, in in the old days it was mostly men, you know, it's mostly white men, and now we're getting representation from various different groups. I mean, we're sitting here. Uh, the four of us all representing different kinds of uh, mm -hmm. you know communities and that's very unusual but it's getting more and more common and and i think that's wonderful 
you know, we, we are about to um, go into an innovation summit that together with CVS Health, we are, we are running and we're very excited about our, our, our competitors, our young companies, our young entrepreneurs who are young, older and, you know, in, in, their, in their development of their company, um, could be any age. Uh, are you seeing anything? And this is a question to all three of you. Um, I understand politics. I understand change in, in so, social. But are you seeing anything on the innovation side that could be addressing these social disparities of health? Because often, and I'm, 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 I'm just prefacing this, often when we see innovation, we, we see innovation that helps those who are already somewhat privileged because they're using an iPhone, they're using apps, they are already kind of motivated to do better. Uh, so are you seeing anything that is coming from um, the innovators that, that, could, that could make a change? Yeah. Ro Dr. Raju. You know, I think I'm very glad to say that in the last four or five years, this topic has really garnered a lot of interest, uh, both uh, politically, socially, as well as inno innovation-wise, it created a lot of things. Uh, there are companies, in fact, in, in fact, I'm involved in one of them, but what we are gained was, we have to give as much importance to social risk factors as we give for clinical risk factors. In other words, if you are a kidney disease, then you give importance to hypertension, you know, they have a, a cardiovascular disease or they have diabetes as a, an important element towards creating it but we also have to include what we call a social vulnerability index. So the company has developed a, based on a, a questionnaire, 15 point questionnaire. It basically grades the patients regarding how vulnerable they are to a particular disease model. And that information is collected and usually correlated together with the medical information to create an overall outcome metric for those patients. So that is coming along. So people have started realizing we shouldn't just depend purely on uh, medical risk factors and also other things. So that is the biggest innovation, which is coming on board and lots and lots of people are trying to get on it and are trying to understand the patient much better than just understand disease better. So this is something, a great innovation, which is moving forward. No, I I think one other area that kind of is at least exciting to me is the kind of these, there are several companies and kind of uh, groups who are trying to use big data and have a better acknowledgement of how to use data effectively to predict which patients might not have good outcomes. And I think kind of uh, that in combination with potential payment system reforms that incentivize kind of providing high value care and kind of achieving good outcomes, you know, financially, like, like uh, I think Richard had a great point, once you financially incentivize getting good outcomes, combination of that plus getting better at predicting those outcomes using novel uh, kind of data handling methods has the potential to really transform the space also to say, okay, I think that I can both provide good care and make more money for providing good care. I think that combination is something that's very good, that very exciting as our, our computational techniques improve in quality. Well, so using more objective measures to assess whether this person is going to be successful. Uh, exactly, especially because if, because you know, in theory, so I would say big data is biased. So anyone who tells you that data does not, or any objective things don't also have bias, that's completely incorrect. But by providing one other semi-objective measure that might help us overcome kind of biases or prejudices that we have in, in the way that we act, kind of provides another tool armamentarium to make sure that we're treating people the best way that they can be treated. And that's, by the way, that's actually addressing one of the questions we have from our audience. And by the way, the audience, if you want to ask questions, please put it in the chat. But we have here um, a, a person who asked the question, um, how do you address provider bias in addition to uh, a competency humility? And that, that, that is a way, um, right? I mean, that is a way to use big data um, to treat patients more based on their objective measures uh, or more objective at least. I'd, I'd say the second half is actually even more important, which is it kind of creating systems that incentivize kind of uh, equity. Is probably, mm -hmm. I think I know Richard Knight works on this a lot, but uh, creating systems that can incentivize equity is probably the number one way to do it because people mm -hmm. will follow the incentives that are created for them. But, but we have to understand that CKD is one of the privileged disease to be by CMS because that's the only disease where you get Medicare reimbursement. If you are a poor and you have, a, let's say, pancreatic cancer, then you don't get 
Medicare, right? You just have a, you know, because as a person who deals with the entire, you know, vulnerable population, there are diseases, if you happen to have them, you end up with uh, really no coverage, right, as, as a part of that. So that's good. But just to, you know, uh, uh, underscore what Dr. Hussein was talking about, I am all for data, but we have to make sure we collect the right data because we, a lot of times we collect the wrong data and we make wrong assumptions. So we need to collect the right data. What is the right data is, is questionable, right? Because everybody argues what's the right data. Is homeless, uh, collecting information on homelessness, a lack of transportation, or they live in a food desert, or they live with a mental illness, or they have lack of insurance, lack of immigration status. All those things are valuable data or not. People argue both ways. You know, people will say, no, that's important. People will be like me will say, yes, that affects outcome. It's important, we need to collect it. The other people will say, it doesn't matter. The disease is a disease, what's the difference? It's all, it, it functions the same way in different people. So I think the point is well taken, but we need to be very cognizant of what kind of data you want to collect. And are we collecting the right data? That's, uh, that's the important point. Well, <clears throat> I just want to add here. You said something, Doc, I want to respond to it. You know, we spend between 13, maybe the more recent numbers are closer to 15 or $16 per patient. In the renal space, mm -hmm. HIV's patients were spending over $2,000. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. There's a great disparity there, and yeah. we're still 20 years behind oncology mm -hmm. in terms of research efforts. We do have the Kidney Precision Medicine Project funded by NID, National Institute for Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. Sorry about the acronyms. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is going to be of great importance to practicing um, nephrologists a few years down the road. So there's a lot of things that are being done, but you know, um, I really think that we have to have a disposition towards action. I've read most of the articles that were sent out, a lot of data, a lot of information. We need action, something simple as early identification of the disease, educate the patient, slow the progression, let the patient look at different options that are available to them, home dialysis, PD, HD at home, in center, many options are available to them, large dialysis facility, small dialysis, and most importantly, if you go into a dialysis facility, you have to go there with a plan for coming out on the other side. The fact that CVS has entered the dialysis market is a major, major shift because of the two dominant players, oligopolies, 70% of the market. And I don't wanna talk in strange terms, but the fact of the matter is, is that it has enough size and scale to make the type of change so that we can have more competition. And most importantly, patients can have choice. One size does not fit all. And, and when we start looking at things from a give patients an option, but in order for patients to be involved in a shared decision to sit down and talk with you docs, they have to be educated. And I think now there are some patients who are health literate and we understand that, but there are many who are not. And I know as an organization, we're doing a webinar right now, educate patients and it will be played for. We've done 20 webinars on COVID related topics so we could educate this population because patients oh, can- Okay, Richard, may I may interrupt there? Because I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to educate patients. But um, you know, again, these groups of patients that we're trying to educate may not always be listening to the webinars, right? They may not be um, sitting at a computer and listening to webinars. So we need to access the patients where they are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not always the case uh, sitting in an office or sitting in a home. We talked about it in our pre you know, discussion. If you are sharing a room with 10 people or you're homeless, you may not have access to uh, you know, uh, uh, this kind of education. So we need to go to them. Um, you know, Dr. Hussein has the opportunity because they come to you in the hospital. They come to the emergency room, but they also go to other places such as churches, uh, nail salons, manicures, I mean, whatever. They, there are places where we can access our patients, where we need to reach them. And the, the kind of education I think that we need to provide may, must also be at different levels. Uh, you know, sitting through a webinar is good for many, 
but may not be appropriate for all. Um, so we need shorter educational seminars. We may need written uh, pamphlets. You know, some of those efforts I think are worth discussing too. And, and you mm -hmm. know, Dr. Say, what does Columbia do uh, to, uh, to educate your, your kidney patient population? If, if anything worth, uh, you know, I'm sure you do a lot of different things um, also situated in an area of New York City where you have um, a, lo a lot of these problems. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a point that's very well taken, uh, first of all, which is that, uh, you know, even as we sit, basically, uh, kind of to summarize what you said, even as we sit in this webinar, people who don't have access to the internet obviously cannot attend. And I'll piggyback on that to say, you know, a lot of the education materials that are, this has been published, a lot of education materials that are available, including through publicly funded things like the SRTR or UNOS, Kind of, if you if you analyze them, they're written at a, a reading level of a uh, grade 13 or 14, um, when the mm -hmm. average patient with chronic kidney disease has a, has kind of half that as their average education level. So kind of, we're really failing there, and kind of, as you say, meeting patients where they are is, is extremely important. I think places like Columbia do some of what they should do. Um, you know, like we have a free clinic available for patients who are uh, uninsured or underinsured. We, we try to do outreach. We have kind of uh, 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 sessions about kidney transplant. Uh, we try to be very aggressive in our education when we uh, are taking care of patients in the clinic or uh, in the dialysis center. We try to use a, a kind of a multidisciplinary team of things like social workers, dietitians, um, uh, all kinds of uh, pharmacists, all kinds of different people to kind of make sure that patients have all their different needs addressed. But ultimately, I think getting out more into the community, it's really the ideal, um, the ideal situation. And if you kind of want some data behind that, you know, several years ago, there's a very famous study published in which um, they did a blood pressure management intervention, where rather than doing office controlled blood pressure, um, they went into uh, historically uh, black barber shops, uh, kind of had a pharmacist present. A lot of the counseling was done by uh, people in the barber shop and showed that they achieved very good blood pressure control, better than you achieve in real life going to a doctor's office, because it was meeting a patient where it's convenient for them, where they have time, potentially in a place that they feel like they might be able to trust people rather than in a healthcare system that might not always treat them fairly. So innovative ideas like that are part of what we need. Like you said, we, we need to figure out how to give patients what they need, where they need it, and when they are most willing to and most ready to accept. I, have, I can quote two innovative ideas we have, we have worked on. The first one is in my last job, we created an app whereby the message will be the same, but the receiver of the message can actually download it to the literacy level. In other words, you read this, you don't understand that you can say, okay, go down to fourth grade literacy level. The AI behind it automatically converts it and gives it to you in the thing. And it also converts the language because uh, there's a Google translator works in the back, which actually I have the app. Uh, it, it works the back and gives you the, uh, in the language you want. And the most important thing, third thing, what Dr. Hussein was talking about is the fact that it also tells you how do you want to receive the message? Because we all are different learners. Some, some are visual learners, some are audible learners. Some people just read a piece of paper and find out. So you can get the same message in the medium in which you want, at the literacy level you want, and the language of your choice. And that app has been very helpful, which we cre I created with my previous employer, which has been very, very helpful in educating health literacy, which my colleagues actually correctly alluded to as a major factor in getting people educated as, as a part of it. So that is a, the crux of it, in other words, doing that. The second most important thing is what you talked about. We have to use what we call as a trusted messengers. The trusted messenger is not always a healthcare delivery system. Right. The trusted messenger is a local clergy, local leader, a person who speaks a language, right? He, Dr. Hussein talked about barbershop, right? An example of that is when I was running health and hospitals, we went in and started doing blood pressure monitoring of the taxi cab drivers in the, in the taxi stand because they couldn't come to the hospital because they were two shifts. Usually they were one, one shift and second shift. Then we found out 48% of the taxi cab drivers in New York City have a high blood pressure, which needed real treatment, right? So just imagine the public safety issue. One of the most jobs you can have, I think, yeah, being we, a New York cab. Imagine the public safety issue of it. You are getting into a cab, there's a 50% chance your cab driver has got uncontrolled blood pressure. So you're basically driving, uh, that doesn't get better, but the stress of driving in New York City, uh, traffic, right? You actually, right. you start off with the baseline, it goes up all the way. So these are some of the innovative ways. Go where the patients are. Use appropriate health literacy app. Three, 
use the trusted leaders and trusted places to get this done. I think all three are so important. And that's what my colleagues have been emphasizing. I 100% agree with them on that. Yeah. One thing, Richard, um, because I think there's a fourth, uh, if I may, is uh, to use patience, actually use peers. <laughs> oh, sorry. You were going to say. No, well, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm laughing because that's just, I mean, I, I don't know how familiar you are with our organization. We're patients, hundreds of thousands of patients, and that's what we do. I mentioned webinars. That's one form. Yeah. We have a website with information that's available. And most importantly, we have ambassadors throughout the country. Exactly. We're dealing globally, talking with and educating patients from patients. Mm -hmm. And I think, of course, that that's going to be very effective, meeting the patients where they are. I look like this, but I probably go places where most people wouldn't go and talk with patients. And I have a lot of people that will approach me and... Um, it's an honor to be able to share some information with them and to refer them to an appropriate venue if we can't provide them that. But I think everyone here understands the value of, um, of educating the patients. And that's something that we just have to continue to do. And, and I've looked at a number of the innovators who are gonna be with us. Um, I think that there's some great ideas to reach out and connect. And most importantly, Patients seeing other patients involved in doing things. You know, there's so many little things. I've had people tell me when they're on dialysis, they itch. The doctor said it's just something that goes along with it. I said, well, let me give you somebody to call and this is what you need to do. And the doctor may not be up on the latest research and that African-Americans just itch much more, as do women. Doctors are not should not be expected to know everything about everything. When you're a patient and you've been in that situation and you can't sleep at night, it is a tremendous, tremendous inconvenience. These little portals, these fistulas we have on our arms that often get <clears throat> out of whack, infected and other things. And if you don't have that working right, you can't get your dialysis and we all know what that means. So I think patients as innovators will deal with many of these challenges and come up with remedies. Um, PD, um, once you get an infection down there, you may not be able to do PD. There are some patients that are coming up with ways that will notice that infection before it's a problem and it can be addressed. So I'm just excited. So about Richard, I, 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 you're, you're, you're speaking our language. I love what you're saying because I, I, you know, that's the whole concept of patient entrepreneurship and is the basis for the innovation challenges. I believe very strongly that those who are experts, uh, you know, the, the experts are those who are living with the disease and they may not come up with new molecules or new biologics or new diagnostics, which Dr. Hussein will do, but, but um, they will come up with so-called life hacks and, mm -hmm. and, and solutions to problems that may not sound difficult. And the doctor may say, oh, okay, well, you can live with that because you're alive. <laughs> Uh, but but it bothers them. And, and that's the whole idea of, of thriving with a disease versus surviving. Um, and yeah, that absolutely. makes all the difference. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask all of you, because we've just gone through, we're still actually in some ways going through, even though we're you know over the peak now, I think, of, of COVID. Did you see anything during COVID that made... Um, an improvement uh, in in kidney in kid in the kidney space. Uh, anything that happened through COVID that because COVID affected kidney. I mean, people with kidney disease were more vulnerable. Uh, COVID itself caused kidney damage. So there was a lot of dialysis done during COVID, and I'm sure Dr. Hussein, you know, can can uh, validate that. But did you see anything that we learned through COVID or was innovated through COVID uh, that we have taken away and are now using? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question and kind of a, a lot of people might not know that actually the first patient in the United States who died of COVID was a dialysis patient. So kind of it's been a problem that's kind of disproportionately affected patients who have kidney disease and especially those with kidney failure. You know, yeah. partially also because, you know, everyone else is staying home, the in-center dialysis patients still have to go out three times a week to a crowded place and uh, kind of leave their home and, and, and kind of be in a vulnerable physical position. Um, I think of all the things uh, that we did wrong, probably the one thing that really turned out well was an expansion of access to like remote care. So uh, especially te telehealth and telehealth across state boundaries. I think that really has the opportunity 
uh, to continue to gain steam and get more and more entrenched in order to provide patients the ability to kind of get care that's more convenient. So if you think about the average person who might not be able to take a whole afternoon off work to go to a doctor's visit, the ability to kind of sit in their uh, kind of uh, car during the lunch break, have their visit, have their follow-up, uh, get cared for, um, or get a second opinion from a kind of an expert, you know, uh, if you think about a rural patient who might not have time to go to a big city uh, where there's a, a kind of a large quaternary care center. Uh, kind of all those things are great. I think as we move forward, we need to figure out how we can make sure though that that same benefit of remote uh, care and telehealth extends to people who might not have good access to it now. So particularly people who might not have smartphones, have access to the internet that's reliable, or who might not speak languages that allow them to be comfortable using technology, because certainly uh, any, as any doctor can tell you, using these services uh, with an interpreter at the same time is very, very difficult. So innovation in that space, I think, could go a, a very long way. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, <clears throat> um, fundamentally, I think that one of the one of the positive outcomes of COVID is that I think providers and other folks really got a reinforcement of the need to communicate with the patients. Um, I've said many times that patients are stressed; they're living in fear because you're not telling them anything. One person said, well, we don't want to give them bad news. I said, but you need to give them some news. You know, before we had the um, vaccines, um, many of the providers were using um, monoclonal antibodies. Now that was being shot down on a political side, but it was something that was a real benefit and helped the patient. So I think the need to understand, and particularly for our population, because if you're a transplant patient, you're on immunosuppressant medication, then the vaccines don't work. So I think that it motivated people to look more at therapeutics. And I think as we go forward, COVID's going to be with us, but it's an endemic, not a pandemic. And if we can get, I'm going to be positive here, some of the leadership to focus on where we need to be, which is on looking at therapeutics, yeah. so that if you get the disease, is just something that I'm sorry, the virus, is there something that can be done to lessen the burden on you? And I think that with the resources that we have and the money that we're spending, that we can do that. And, and again, um, um, I, I can't but help but um, support what um, Dr. Hussein said in terms of the enhancement and improvement in telehealth. Many patients in rural areas and again, we're not gonna be able to address everybody, but for those that we can, we have a lot of patients that live out in rural areas. And if they have to leave one dialysis facility, it may be an hour before they can get to another one. So if they have access to telehealth and can get some basic information that way, it's a big plus. And then we'll continue to work it on it. And from the other side, we continue to work with the legislators and the administration about reimbursement issues. You know, we, we need to make certain that we keep funds flowing. <clears throat> I mean, the difference between a telephone call and an actual telehealth is the difference in billing for a doctor. And they've had seminars about that. Um, so I think that there are a lot of well-meaning people, but as far as I'm concerned, we need to do more because we have a large group of patients, 37 million, that have been diagnosed. And then we have X number of patients that actually get the disease and head towards dialysis, which we know is very expensive. So I think we're doing some great things. We just need to continue and not be blindsided by something like this happening again. Yeah. Anything, Dr. Raju, from COVID? No, I, no, I, I completely agree with them. I think the COVID taught us a lot of lessons. One is uh, we understood the surge capacity better. Uh, we will continue to understand the logistics of healthcare a little better. Uh, we have a new modalities of management patient like telemedicine, telehealth, that is getting a good thing happening over a period of time. And as we develop this, because I'm in the process of developing some guidelines uh, nationally regarding the telemedicine, but we have to be very careful of a digital divide which happens in this country because the people who are poor, people who are really not educated, people who are old, they are, don't have the, they are not able to access that. In fact, those are people who really need the telemedicine instead of getting out of the house and then going to doctor's house and waiting there. So we need to be very careful of that. 
And also there are certain geographical section in this country, which has got a, absolutely no internet. You know, you could be in the middle of Montana, there in 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 Idaho, in in Iowa, there is there are issues. So we have to really create that. So hopefully this will create a better internet connection for everybody across the place. And one of the things I plead with this audience, as I do with everybody else, the healthcare insurance companies should really make the internet connection as a part of the benefit package, mm -hmm. just like they give you a benefit of. Gym training, you go, you go, you go to an insurance company, they give you a subscription subscription to gym. I think we need to really have a, a subscription to internet services so that they don't have to take it out of pocket to do that. So those are some of the great ideas we are coming up with. But I think this is a very educational. COVID taught us some good lessons and we should learn from it. I agree. I want to add one thing, and maybe controversial, but I, I I think those are all great ideas, um, and 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 I think it actually makes us more aware of what what the issues are, right? We can analyze what the deficiencies were, and and we have addressed them, and 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 perhaps the whole infrastructure improves. But there's a, also psychological actually experience that this was was that the normal person, uh, the individual who never has had a chronic disease you know, had to isolate, had to quarantine, had to be careful and felt vulnerable, you know, to actually get sick or to die. Even. And, and that is a, a kind of a normal situation for a transplant patient, for an ESRD patient, for a cancer patient, even multiple sclerosis type one, you know, <laughs> patients with really serious chronic disease. And uh, for those, COVID was of course extra dangerous, but the accommodation was not as difficult. So there was a certain learning and humility, I think, among the so-called normal population <laughs> that they're, they're, they had to now feel vulnerable. And I think that's good for people. I think that the um, hubris in a human being is always very dangerous. And if we can cause more humility or, and trigger more humility in, in everyone, even though in a political sense, many of them who, who you know, had to do it in hiding because they didn't want to show that they were afraid, but, but they were, um, that's a good learning for the country uh, and for, yeah. for the world, right? I mean, we- Absolutely. The, they said, Karen, they said that COVID is a great equalizer. That's a good thing you talked about in there, but it's not, Completely true, but mostly no. true. Yeah. Because there are there are people who suffered more than other yeah. people did. But but at the end of it, I understand your your concept that how we have a increased uh, respect for yeah. the people with chronic diseases, how I they manage so. themselves, and that gave me a big big. Uh, you are absolutely right. It opened my eyes to the what is normal day to day living for them is absolutely impossible for me to deal with. Right. I, I think I see your point. Good. I think that's a good that's a good way of seeing yeah. it. I, I hope that that stays, um, you know, among among people and people just don't forget about it. Um, mm -hmm. and, but but um, it, it is it is worth noting. Um, uh, and also for doctors, I mean, I read um, Dr. Cato's, uh, uh, I think, uh, note about experiencing COVID in as a physician uh, in uh, at Columbia, and mm -hmm. that that was. You know, very important to see how a physician who normally treats patients experiences a disease that, that was so very uh, strong. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I'd like to thank all of you. This was a really uh, engaging discussion, and um, I know we could continue, and um, I, I hope we will uh, in various different ways. I think you're, we're, we all want to work together um, going forward. I'd love to, to continue the discussion individually, but also as a group. I think if we come together like this, we can make a, we can make a change. And I want to thank CBS Health and Kidney Care especially, and, and uh, Bruce Culleton and the team you know, for really um, uh, betting on this and, and putting on an innovation challenge with us because we need more innovation in the space, but we also need more discussion and more education and more Absolutely. awareness. Um, and we need more patients standing up for, for yeah. their, uh, you know, their future. Um, and and that's, that's what we're looking for through, uh, through various efforts. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely.